Our nation's highway system comprises literally billions of cubic yards of concrete. And it's growing. No wonder so much attention is given to concrete materials performance. Our goal is to use materials that will produce durable concrete, not susceptible to cracking, spalling, or other defects. There are, of course, a number of factors that contribute to concrete deterioration. But in this program, we'll focus on freezing and thawing. We'll begin with a look at causes and prevention. Then we'll move on to testing, both conventional and new. Let's start then with causes and prevention. Freezing and thawing cause a great deal of stress in concrete because any water trapped in the aggregates will expand when it freezes, causing the concrete to break up. Pop-outs and D-line cracking are typical results. It's difficult to control this type of damage for two reasons. First, the concrete doesn't get a chance to dry because it's often covered with snow or ice. And second, the freeze-thaw cycle is repeated again and again throughout the winter. De-icing salts are very helpful in maintaining traffic and improving safety under winter driving conditions. However, they can attack the concrete surface and lead to what is termed scaling of concrete. The concrete must have the required amount of entrained air if it will be subjected to freezing and other severe conditions. Recommendations on proper air contents are given in the ACI 201 Guide to Durable Concrete and in the Sharp HighwayCon Computer Expert System. Even though the concrete has the proper air content, problems with durability still may arise due to the presence of freeze-thaw susceptible aggregates. The best solution then is to carefully test the aggregates before they're used. That way, we can determine which aggregates function best under severe winter conditions. And that brings us to testing. To see how and why the new tests evolved, we'll begin with two conventional tests, Ashto T104 and T161. Let's start with the most commonly used test, T104. The formal name of this test is soundness of aggregates by use of sodium sulfate or magnesium sulfate. This is one of the earliest tests developed for aggregate durability and it has significant limitations. The aggregates are not actually subjected to freezing and thawing during the test and reproducibility can be poor. However, the test is performed by many highway agencies. Your first step for this, as with all other tests where chemical substances are used, is to carefully review the manufacturer's safety data sheets before working with the materials. The test procedures are the same for both types of solutions. The difference is an interpretation of the results. The test procedure involves soaking a prepared aggregate sample in either solution for a period of 16 to 18 hours. Then the samples are drained free of solution and placed in a drying oven until a constant weight is achieved. During drying, the oven temperature has to be kept at 230 degrees Fahrenheit plus or minus 9 degrees or 110 degrees Celsius plus or minus 5 degrees. This soaking and drying cycle is normally repeated 5 to 10 times. Next, the samples are washed free of sulfates under warm running water. And each fraction is dried to a constant weight. Then the sample is re-sieved to find the fraction retained on each sieve. This is compared with the initial weight and the loss is calculated. Weight loss limits for coarse aggregates, which are the primary concerns for freeze-thaw durability, are 12% if sodium sulfate is used 
and 18% if magnesium sulfate is used. You should be aware, though, that this test is an overall indication of the soundness of aggregates. It doesn't necessarily reflect the same processes which occur during freezing. The test results for a given aggregate may not be reflective of its actual performance in the field. A test which more closely follows field conditions is ASHTO designation T161. Officially, it's referred to as standard method of test for resistance of concrete to rapid freezing and thawing. This test can be used for the evaluation of aggregate performance in concrete or for the evaluation of concrete mixes themselves such as when new admixtures or other concrete materials are being qualified. The test calls for concrete specimens in the form of prisms. These can range from 3 to 5 inches in width and depth and from 11 to 16 inches in length. As an option, stainless steel gauge studs for measurement of length change during testing can be cast into the specimens. Concrete for the test is produced in the lab using standard procedures. It's important, though, that if different aggregate sources are being compared, that they're all batched in the same moisture condition prior to mixing the concrete. The concrete specimens are cured in saturated lime water for 14 days unless otherwise specified. This brings the concrete to a saturated state prior to the test, making for a very severe test. After 14 days of curing, the specimens are transferred to a holding tank with a temperature close to 40 degrees Fahrenheit or 4 degrees Celsius. An ordinary refrigerator can be used for this purpose. Then they're tested for resonant frequency using the equipment described in ASTM C215. The resonant frequency is related to the stiffness of the specimen. If damage occurs during the freeze-thaw test, the stiffness will decrease and will be reflected by a decrease in resonant frequency. At this point, you should also weigh the test specimens to the nearest gram. Generally, but not always, damage from freezing and thawing will remove part of the surface layer of concrete and be reflected by a loss of weight. If you're following the length measurement option, an initial length measurement should also be made. Damage during testing will be reflected by an increase in length. These expansions, however, are very small, only three hundredths to a tenth of a percent so be very careful making this measurement. Now the specimens can be transferred to a freeze-thaw chamber. This is a Procedure A machine which maintains water around the specimen during the entire freeze-thaw process. Concretes may also be tested by Procedure B where the water is pumped out of the chamber prior to freezing and pumped back in prior to thawing. With the Procedure A machines, the chambers are programmed to lower the temperature from 40 to 0 degrees and raise it from 0 to 40 degrees in not less than 2 and not more than 4 hours. If Celsius, 4 to 18 below and back. These machines are capable of running 8 of these cycles per 24 hour period. Approximately every 36 cycles, the specimens are removed from the containers and their weight, length, and resonant frequency are measured. It's important that the specimens be kept moist at all times during these measurements. The resonant frequency readings are used to calculate the relative dynamic modulus, or RDM. This is computed from the measured frequency divided by the initial frequency squared. This procedure is normally repeated for 300 cycles or until the RDM falls below 60%. If aggregates are being evaluated, some agencies may run the test for 350 cycles. When concrete materials other than aggregates are being evaluated, 
The RDM should be greater than 80% at the end of the test if the concrete is to be considered durable. Aggregates can also be evaluated based on the length change during the test. Different agencies have established different limits. This can be done in your state by selecting a number of aggregates with known performance, running the test, and then determining the expansion which represents the frost susceptible aggregates. Suggested expansion limits range from 35 thousandths to one tenth of a percent. Again, correlate the test with materials used in your state before setting the acceptance limits. Many state highway agencies use AASHTO T161 Procedure B, rapid freezing in air and thawing in water for evaluation of aggregate freeze-thaw susceptibility. In this procedure, the specimens are directly exposed to air which is cooled to zero degrees Fahrenheit or 18 below Celsius during the freeze period. This may result in a loss of moisture during the test and may not be representative of actual winter conditions. The difference, of course, is that concrete surfaces are often covered with snow or ice during freezing and are not able to dry out. To overcome this problem, Sharp modified the procedure to include wrapping the specimens in terry cloth to prevent moisture loss. And that brings us to the new tests. Here we'll look at proposed procedure C and hydraulic fracture. Proposed procedure C's full title includes rapid freezing in air and thawing in water. To use Procedure C, you'll need specimens measuring 3 by 4 by 16 inches. As in Procedure A, the specimens are cured for 14 days in a tank of saturated lime water. Then they're removed from the lime water and placed in a holding tank. The temperature of the water should be maintained between 40 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit, or between 4 and 5 Celsius. The specimens are removed from the holding tank. Wiped off to remove any excess moisture. And weighed. Then they're transferred to a length comparator where an initial length reading is taken. The next step is to use a new procedure developed for measuring resonant frequency and dissipation of energy known as damping during the test. Notice how the specimen is suspended on piano wire in order to improve sensitivity of the response. To make the measurement, a miniature accelerometer is attached to one end of the specimen with a rubber band. The other end is tapped three times with a small instrumented hammer. The response signal is fed to a computer which determines the response spectrum. The large peak on the screen represents the fundamental frequency of vibration. The computer then calculates the damping constant of the specimen. A decrease in damping is an early predictor of potential damage. Sharp research has shown that the damping measurement is more sensitive than the normal resident frequency measured by ASTM C215. You can see that damping decreases much more rapidly than relative modulus. After making these initial measurements, the test specimens are wrapped in terry cloth so all surfaces are covered. Strips of Velcro are sewn onto the terry cloth wraps to hold them in place on the specimen. Rubber bands secure the wraps on each end of the specimen. The specimens are then transferred to a freeze-thaw machine. This large capacity machine can hold up to 75 specimens and can be used for the standard procedure B or the new procedure C. During the thaw period, the specimens are completely immersed in water. 
The wraps will hold the moisture and keep the concrete wet when the tank is emptied and the freeze cycle begins. This way, the specimens are surrounded by ice during the freeze cycle, even though the water has been drained. At frequent intervals, the specimens are removed from the freeze-thaw machine, their cloth wraps are taken off, and the resonant frequency, weight, length, and damping are measured. Careful attention to these measurements is important if consistent results are to be obtained. The measurements are normally carried out to 300 cycles, or until failure of the specimens. This procedure more closely simulates concretes frozen in the field. And the use of damping to monitor damage allows a more rapid assessment of freeze-thaw resistance. While these freeze-thaw methods have been used successfully to identify aggregates susceptible to decracking, the investment in equipment is considerable. They are labor-intensive, and most important of all, require up to seven weeks to complete, not including preparation and curing of the specimens. In response to these issues, Sharp developed the test procedure Hydraulic Fracture of Coarse Aggregate, which is more rapid and simpler to perform. The test is based on the assumption that hydraulic pressures produced in concrete by freezing can be simulated by subjecting aggregates submerged in water to high pressures. When the pressure is released, the air compressed in the pores of the aggregates expands and pushes the water back out. Fracture occurs when the water cannot be released quickly enough. The aggregate for this test should be divided into convenient individual size ranges prior to the test. For instance, this could include aggregate passing the one and a half inch sieve and retained by the three quarter inch sieve, or aggregate passing the three quarter inch sieve and retained on the half inch sieve. The selected aggregate is then washed over a sieve to remove all surface dust. The aggregate is then dried to constant weight at 250 degrees Fahrenheit, or 121 degrees Celsius, and allowed to cool to room temperature. Then the aggregate is placed in a water-based solution of a silane penetrating sealer for 30 seconds. Afterward, the aggregate is allowed to drain for five minutes. Then the aggregate is placed back into an oven, dried to constant weight overnight, and allowed to cool to room temperature. Next, the sample is placed in a rubber tumbler, the same type of tumbler available for polishing rocks. The tumbler is placed on the motorized drive for one minute. After one minute, the tumbler is opened and the aggregate is sieved over a 3 8 inch sieve. Any pieces passing the 3 8 inch sieve are discarded. Then the remaining sample is weighed. The sample is then placed on a tabletop and the pieces are carefully counted. A special chamber is used to pressurize the sample. This chamber is commercially available as a 100 bar pressure membrane extractor and is used in ASTM method D3152. The unit should be modified with a second top plate substituted for the standard bottom plate. A cylinder of compressed nitrogen is attached to the pressure chamber through a regulator and fittings. The regulator should have a capacity of 1,500 PSI. The sample is placed into the pressure chamber and distributed across the bottom plate. The lid is then attached and each bolt is torqued down to 60 inch pounds. After it's sealed, the chamber is rotated to the vertical test position. 
The pressure valve is closed and the main valve on the nitrogen tank is opened. The pressure regulator should then be set to 1150 PSI. Now the pressure chamber is filled with water. When the chamber is filled, the lines are purged of air by briefly opening the drain valve for about 30 seconds. Then, all the valves are closed. The pressure valve is opened and the chamber is pressurized to 1150 PSI for five minutes. It may be necessary to slightly adjust the pressure regulator to maintain exactly 1150 PSI. After about four and a half minutes, the drain line is disconnected from the exhaust valve. After exactly five minutes, the exhaust valve is opened. You should always wear ear protection while performing this step because the noise can be very loud, especially in a confined space. Next, the drain line is reconnected and the pressure chamber is refilled with water. The chamber is pressurized as before and the process is repeated except that this time the pressure is maintained for only two minutes. This process is repeated eight additional times for a total of ten pressure cycles. Then the chamber is drained by reattaching the drain line, rotating the chamber to the horizontal position and opening the pressure valve to allow the compressed air in the lines to force the water out of the chamber. The chamber is unbolted at this point and the sample is removed piece by piece. The sample is then dried to constant weight at 250 degrees Fahrenheit or 121 degrees Celsius. Then the sample is placed back into the tumbler for one minute of rotation and then sieved through a 3 8 and a number 4 sieve. The amounts retained on both sieves are weighed and recorded on the data sheet included in your user's manual. The test is continued for a total of four more sets of cycles. This will result in a total of 50 individual pressurization cycles. The percentage of fracturing after each 10 cycles is calculated as shown in your manual. Then the hydraulic fracture index or HFI is determined. This can be done either by graphical interpolation as shown here or by doing the calculations described in your manual. The percent mass loss or ML is also calculated. The report should identify the sample, the initial sample size range, the percentage fracture after each 10 cycles, the percentage mass loss after each 10 cycles, and the hydraulic fracture index. An HFI of at least 75 is necessary to ensure that the aggregate will not be susceptible to decracking. Aggregate with an HFI greater than 75 is almost surely durable. However, if the index is below 75, you may still want to run freeze-thaw tests. That's because some aggregates will do well in service even with a low HFI. We have seen that freeze-thaw durability is an important consideration in design of concrete mixes and in selection of aggregates. Properly designed concrete made with durable aggregates will ensure many decades of good performance, even when exposed to harsh winter conditions.